thank you so much, uh, Laura Mickey, for joining Riso from England. And it is again a wonderful possibility for us to have you, your expertise, your dexterity, and your professional skills you are willing to share with us. It's such a possibility for us. So I just want just want to start. Riso is a platform where we normally and mainly seek expansion and sort of you know better possibilities for research specifically sociological perspectives but at the same time different perspectives different domain and different dimensions we are very much open to look at so that's the reason we are excited to have you since you have a different background and different context which is very much connected to global climate change and different stuff sustainable development that's what i figure out my understanding so i'm just going to pitch into my first question it says like uh, uh, just define yourself give us your introduction to our audience and a little brief us up on your qualification and your area of work of course yeah uh, so my name is dr laura mickey and i'm based in the united kingdom um, but i work for a us based nonprofit called mangrove action project and uh, well i guess my background first um, i have a phd in marine biology specifically looking at marine ecology and invertebrate biology in mangrove forests in Indonesia. So I spent a couple of years researching in Indonesia and also doing research at the university here um, at Portsmouth University in the UK. Um, and, and then I did various other research projects looking at carbon breakdown in mangroves and plastics and microplastics in coastal ecosystems and mangroves across Southeast Asia. And now I'm working with Mangrove Action Project. And so we work to protect and restore mangrove forests all across the world. Um, and we do that mostly through education and capacity building for local groups um, working on mangrove restoration projects. So thanks a lot, briefing us about your work, your qualification, your area of work. It is again a possibility and opportunity for us to figure out and venture into you know, different contexts and experience. Now I would like to switch on to my second question. It is kindly elaborate on the community-based ecological mangrove restoration, CBE, MR, in different settings that you mean sort of launching and sort of working upon. I guess to start with, for those that don't know, um, mangrove forests are they're trees that live in salt water. They're the only trees in the world that can live in salt water, um, and they live um, along coastlines um, in tropical and subtropical um, countries around the world. Um, so they live in what we call the intertidal zone, um, so the area where the tide comes in and the tide goes out every day. Um, and they live with their roots in that um, in that water. And so it's quite a challenging environment, um, which means it can also be quite challenging to restore mangrove forests. And so we've seen many failures across the world in restoration projects. And usually that's because groups are planting the wrong species in the wrong place um, or planting mangroves where they shouldn't be or planting them in areas that are you know, the issues or the challenges that cause the mangrove loss haven't been overcome. And so what we do um, at Mangrove Action Project, we don't actually run restoration projects ourselves because we believe they should be run by the local groups, by the local communities. And so we offer technical advice and we do trainings and workshops on best practices in mangrove restoration. So we have our methodology, which is called Community-Based Ecological Mangrove Restoration, CBEMR. It's quite a long title, um, but we really wanted to highlight the community-based um, aspect of it. Not just communities, but all local groups, all local stakeholders that have you know, an invested interest in the mangrove forests. But particularly the communities, because a lot of communities rely on the mangrove forests for their local livelihoods or for construction and building materials and so we really wanted to highlight the you know the point of involving local communities and they are the long-term guardians of the mangrove forests and so involving them is absolutely essential you know for the long-term success of restoration projects and then the other side of it the, the ecological mangrove restoration um 
because we want to highlight the need for working with nature to restore the mangrove forests rather than just kind of go into a mass planting trees we want to make sure that we're working with nature understanding the local issues understanding the local species to restore the the mangroves so that they can come back you know long term and healthy great assalamu alaikum salam sujatera shalom om swastiastu namo buddhaya salam kabajikam Hi everyone, it's Laura here from Mangrove Action Project with an intro to the process of CBEMR, Community-Based Ecological Mangrove Restoration. Okay, so before you jump into your mangrove restoration project by planting or building a nursery, let's tick off these steps and always together with the local community and the local stakeholders. The first step is to research the biophysical aspects of your proposed site especially the hydrology, stresses, local species, and elevations. Then, move on to some social research to understand the needs of the local people, the mangrove ownership, as well as the site history and potential for livelihoods. Study a local, natural reference mangrove to give you an idea of what might be possible at your restoration site. Through your analysis, you should be building up an understanding of the problems and changes needed on your site. If not, you might need more data. It's now time to map out your plans and discuss the objectives of your actions. Then, moving on to implementing your restoration activities, which might include digging channels or other work to improve hydrology. Make sure to keep monitoring the site and adapt your plan as you find out what is and isn't working. And remember to keep working with local communities throughout the project and all the local stakeholders. We're happy to help if you have any questions, so please get in touch. Good luck with your project and check out the links below for more information. Sampa Jumpa! learning that uh, your project focuses community-based intervention. That's what I figure out. And it is important because in sociology also, we do seek a lot of community-based intervention in our research, in our social projects. So it is really awesome to once again, uh, you know, repeating that uh, your projects have community-based interventions and possibilities so that's what I figured out. Now I would like to move on to my third question. It says, explain how do you conduct social research? Important question from our perspective also, explain how do you conduct social research to understand the needs of the local community uh, when planning to plant a mangrove site? Really good question. Um, so when, when it comes to a restoration project, we often conduct two types of research. Um, so the first type is the environmental or what we might call biophysical research. And that's really looking at understanding the forest itself or the degraded area where the trees have been lost and looking at the soil type, the salinity, you know, the tides and things like that. But then, and that's really understanding kind of the science of it. But then... There's also the social side of it, which is absolutely vital, like you said, for, for the restoration projects. And so that's working with the local community, the local forestry officers, all of the local groups. Um, especially as mangrove scientists, you know, we really understand the science of the trees, but actually understanding the local context and the local forest, that's absolutely down to that local ecological knowledge. So the, the, the local communities, the local groups. And so we often conduct either interviews or kind of household level meetings, um, or we conduct whole community level or government meetings to understand the actual kind of local knowledge, the site history, we might say. And so asking questions like, what did the mangrove forest used to look like? Um, when was it lost? What were the reasons for loss? Maybe who owns the land? Um, and then also really understanding the needs of the local community. And we often, you know, we often see that it affects the poorest in society the most. So the communities that really rely on the forests, either for building materials or for livelihoods or for food security. And so their needs absolutely have to be met. If they need to chop down the trees to build houses because they don't have any sort of 
access to alternatives, then those have to be addressed for the project to be successful. If we want the forest to be restored, then we have to focus also on the needs of the community and, you know, really kind of finding those alternatives um, so that the community can have a livelihood and have an income whilst also seeing the forest thrive. I want to learn that, uh, that bio, biophysical part of your research and how do you conduct these two types of research. Again, what I figure out as for you know, words and interaction is like the, the focus is the very site, the very community where the research project is being conducted. So I would like to now move on to my fourth question. It says like share the important restoration activities, share the important restoration activities that you have applied during mangrove projects to assist the local community. And I think it's really important to kind of think about the local context of the site. Um, so there is no kind of one size fits all solution to mangrove restoration. It really depends on the local issues and the local challenges. Um, and so we really have to, and working with the local community and the local groups, we really have to understand why the mangroves were lost. Um, because if that site has now become an aquaculture pond or it's been built into a coastal development, then it probably isn't likely to be able to be returned or restored into a mangrove forest. And so understanding those local issues um, is really important. Um, and then kind of looking at the challenges and how we overcome those issues. But I would say um, a few of the, the kind of activities that we usually do um, is working with the local groups to understand which tree species used to be there and trying to restore as many of those species as possible rather than just mass planting one single species um, because then when it comes to resilience to climate change or pests or diseases you know if there's an outbreak of a pest or disease that whole forest is likely to be lost Whereas if we try to restore as many of the local species as possible, um, then it has a lot more resist re resilience. Um, and then also there's the habitat available for lots of different terrestrial and marine animal species as well, which is what a lot of the local groups rely on, you know, for their food sources. And so, and also a challenge that we often come across with mangrove forests is... Um, because they really rely on the tide coming in and going out every single day, they really need that water to drain from the soil so that the oxygen can get down into the roots. And so we've seen a lot of areas where the soil um, or the water gets trapped in an area because rivers have been blocked by, um, you know, if there's flooding and debris comes down a river or soil gets washed down the river and then it can get trapped in the river or trapped in some channels. And then if that water gets trapped in the mangroves, um, then it's going to suffocate the trees and they're not going to be able to survive. And so one of the issues we often have to overcome is removing debris or, you know, redigging channels so that the tidal flow can be restored. Um, you know, so we call that like hydrology, so water flow. Um, so that they're kind of the main two issues that we often work with communities to do is to restore the water flow to an area um, and also making sure that um, as many of the, the local tree species are being restored as possible. Um, actually, I guess another issue that I've just thought of as well. Um, so working recently in Kenya um, and also Bangladesh and India, um, we see a lot of so animal grazing, so cows or goats that are just free roaming. Um, they will eat all of the kind of seedlings and all of the trees that are growing. Um, and so, and sometimes that's the only reason the trees aren't coming back is because, you know, the local goats are eating everything. And so finding alternative food sources for the goats um, can also really help restore the mangrove forest and, and actually allow it to come back with all of, without that grazing from, you know, destroying all of the seeds. Mm, that's great important to learn your understanding and uh, professional dexterity explanation on this one question. Now, I would like to move on to my next question, which is just to wrap up. Uh, question says, like, explain how the establishment of mangrove forest can contribute to combating global climate change. They're actually incredibly important for mitigating climate change. Um, and so, because 
a lot of the root system of the mangrove trees is actually above ground. And so there's a lot of quite, you know, dense overlapping roots above the ground. And so those roots really help to anchor the soil, anchor the sand and the coastline in place and stop erosion from happening, which is obviously incredibly important for lots of, um, you know, coastal communities and cities. And they're also really important for buffering and like absorbing the energy from waves, um, from cyclones, from hurricanes, um, even from tsunamis. And so, and again, that's because of a lot of the, the root system is above ground. When water hits the trees, it really kind of reduces the energy of that what those waves um, and also the wind um, and the energy from storms. And so they've been shown to cause a, like create a lot of protection uh, for coastal communities, um, for settlements and for cities that are kind of existing behind the mangrove forest. Um, then really in terms of climate change, even though the, the mangrove forest um, only grow on coastlines, they're incredible at uptaking carbon. Um, and so we've heard a lot about carbon offsets and carbon, you know, in recent years. And mangroves can actually take up four to five times more carbon um, and store it four to five times better than tropical rainforests. So they're really important for, for taking up carbon. And then I guess my final point would be because of those kind of overlapping intricate root systems, mangroves are really important habitat for both terrestrial and marine species, but importantly, a lot of commercially important fish species. And so a lot of fish um, will spend their juvenile kind of life stage, grow up in the mangrove forests. And that's because all of those overlapping root systems create lots of kind of hiding places from predators um, and also produces a lot of food for, for lots of fish. And so a lot of fish will grow up or live in mangrove forests before they go out onto coral reefs or the open ocean. So they're incredibly important places, you know, for, for food security and for, for livelihoods for millions of people around the world. Okay. Is there anything, since we have a little more time, you want, you want to talk? Is there any area? Because we've already through with our five questions. Is there anything you want to talk more? Yeah, I, I guess for me, you know, and I think, for, you know, you, you're interested as well in, in really highlighting the need for that. The, the work with the local communities um, and we see so often groups just want to go and plant trees because they want to say that they've planted a hundred thousand you know mangrove trees um, but actually you know for us really making sure that the restoration is done right so that the projects can last into the long term is, is so important and so making sure that those projects are firmly baked with the local communities who are going to be the ones that either rely on those mangrove forests or can you know be the long-term guardians of those forests and so making sure that you bring together that science and the environmental knowledge and the social social knowledge is the only way for you know to see that long-term success um and so that's something that we are always trying to highlight is the the need for the projects to be community-based and to involve the local forestry officers and the local government um, rather than just going in and mass planting trees but really working alongside the local people and alongside nature to make sure that the project is done in the right way. Mm, that's great. So thanks a lot yeah. once again, Laura. Mickey, for joining and answering these five and one questions from a climatological perspectives, from your profession dexterity, such as like mangrove and all, because we're covering this topic and we're so platform for the very first time. That's the reason we are also very much excited and it's quite visible. There is manifestation that we are talking to a right person who has professional skills and dexterity and knowledge since your expertise. Uh, talk about mangrove and all the direct uh, directly have connection with the climatological balance also and a lot of important like community research and, and how local community can be can have involvement and what can be their importance we've learned about that such a wonderful session for session for our audience as well and for us to learn and to have you on this platform once again i just want to tell you Riso is a platform which is primarily and mainly uh, there existing for the expansion of academic and research specifically we just try to you know sort of apply sociological perspective but or at the same time we are also open to 
peep into and sort of venture into different, you know, academic perspectives, how we can make this world a better possibility for us and for the upcoming humanity, which is going to happen after us. So thanks a lot, uh, Laura, Nikki, for joining me. So so much for having me. Um, it's been great to be on here and to kind of share, share my thoughts. Um, and thank you for putting together such a great platform.